Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to COPA's virtual national fly-in. We hope you are having a blast. I, uh, I hope that uh, you have been going through all the different tabs. There's a lot of sessions today. You can go visit some booths uh, and enjoy some uh, different experiences to enhance your flying overall. I'm Sharon Chung. I'm the Director of National Programming here with COPA, and I have the pleasure to be with Peter Campbell, our Director of External Relations. Uh, he is going to walk through our pilot recruitment current training today. Peter, would you like to add anything on your background before we get started and let us know where you're from, uh, you're sitting from today. Hey, Sharon. Yeah, we're down in Prince Edward County in the uh, town of Wellington and uh, it's a beautiful day on the beach, I'm sure. Unfortunately, I'm uh, inside here uh, with you rather than being out there in this virtual world. Uh, I've got a little bit more introductory comments once we get into the slides. So uh, rather than waste more time, let's get right at it. Okay, so good day and welcome to everyone. Now, why are you? Okay. Uh, why is that not working? That's weird. Okay, do I have to use that? I guess I have to use that. All right. Okay, yeah, welcome to good day and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome to our pilot recurring training program, uh, General Aviation Seminar. As you know, it's the 27th of June and it's time for us to get going with this very valuable and much anticipated seminar. My name is Peter Campbell. I am the COPA Director of External Relations. I've been with COPA now about seven months. My background is rather extensive, a combination of private, uh, commercial and uh, military flying, both uh, fixed wing and rotary wing, along with uh, some glider time a long time ago and uh, more recently, about 10 years ago, about two years of operational experience with uh, small UAVs and RPAs uh, in support of the Canadian military operation in Afghanistan. Just be, uh, before I joined COPA, I was the general manager and chief flying instructor at the Ottawa Flying Club in Ottawa, of course. So this is our little confirmation slide that we put in here, a public notice that this seminar today is a Transporter Canada approved and authorized pilot recurrent training program. It meets the 24 month requirements thereof. And uh, in the next slide here, we'll just uh, tell you exactly uh, a few more things about that. Our mission uh, in this seminar is very simple. We want to reduce the number of accidents in general aviation. How do we want to do that? Or how do we expect to do that? By facilitating the transformation of how we fly, how we think before and during our flights, and how we act when we're flying and create a safety culture. So uh, a very important administrative points here. So to, re to record this in your logbook, you need to do as this slide says. You need to record the date of the presentation, which of course is today, the 27th of June. You need to record my name, Peter Campbell, the title of the training seminar, which is Approach et Atterrissage, or Approach and Landings, making our arrival a happy ending, happy ending. your signature entered below the above. And uh, to make it complete, you can also put in the car's reference, uh, as is on the slide, 401081B, and 408, oh, 40108 brackets three. Keep all that in your logbook and um, that will ensure that if anybody uh, doubts that you were here, uh, that's proof. As you know, there are three phases of flight uh, according to both ourselves and Transport Canada. And today uh, we are going to focus on phase three, approche et atterrissage, approach and landing. Uh, we want to get our aircraft to the ground safely, uh, and there are challenges to doing that. And that's what we're going to look at today. So the agenda for today, we're going to look at basically a couple of aspects of what we just talked about. Uh, we're going to talk about getting to the airport safely, looking at loss of control in flight, establishing a stabilized approach, and a good transition to landing and a question and answer period thereafter. We're going to look at three different uh, case studies in this. Uh, we're concerned about the unfortunate consistencies 
that there are so many accidents and incidents involving the approach and landing phase. We want to, you to be aware that this is where uh, we tend to be the most vulnerable uh, to fatigue and errors of judgment because we've, we're finishing a flight rather than starting it. Um, we are unfortunately flying our planes into each other or into the ground and oftentimes with fatal results. We're dividing this approach into three uh, case studies as we said, so let's get on with that. All right, so we are, uh, let's focus on part one with considerations on how we can join the airport uh, safely with our eyes and uh, eyes wide open and ready to avoid uh, any unhappy meetings with the skies, in the skies over or near aerodromes and airports. We're gonna review the correct procedures first and then we'll get into our first case study. It will walk us through a rather tragic and deadly meeting that took place overhead carp Ontario Airport back in 2018. So we, uh, we've all read about, and I'm sure we've practiced uh, the arrival procedures at either an ATF aerodrome or an MF aerodrome, or even a control zone aerodrome. ATF, of course, standing for aerodrome traffic frequency, MF for mandatory frequency, and CZ for control zone. So, we ask ourselves, what are some of the considerations that we have prior to contacting and or entering the airport environment? So, okay. so some of the considerations when we're preparing to arrive at our chosen destination, we want to get gather together as much information as possible. We must arrive ready to listen to the AWOS or ATIS, your dome weather uh, information, or uh, if it's an ATF, an aerodrome traffic frequency, uh, probably an operator who's uh, a volunteer or perhaps providing us with uh, basic information about the airport. These sources enable the pilot to evaluate the weather, the traffic, and the runways in use. So of course our AWOS, ATIS uh, and briefing will give us those specific details. What's the active runway? Uh, who's there? Uh, how alert uh, are we now from the traffic that's there? Hopefully we already know from looking at in our CFS what the circuit joining procedures are and we are planning our approach and result to that. We've done pre-descent checks or pre-entry checks into the circuit. We've considered emergency situations and we also want to make sure we understand the differences between mandatory frequency aerodromes and aerodrome traffic frequency aerodromes, which we're going to recover in detail now. So uh, before we get to the diagram, let's review the expected procedures that should be in effect at that uncontrolled ATF or MF airport. In this case, an ATF airport. As stated here, the arriving pilot must weigh the options, decide, and then broadcast the arrival plan with his intentions. The considerations and how to, uh, how to properly arrive at the airport. So we know that uh, typically all turns in the circuit are left unless stated otherwise. We're expected to land on the active runway and the active runway is either the one that other aircraft are using, or if it's just you, uh, the intended runway in use. This may be the runway that is best aligned with the wind, but not necessarily so. At an uncontrolled ATF or MF airport, the pilot has final authority. Uh, must use, uh, if he must use another runway, communicate with other traffic to ensure that there is no conflict. And that circuit is normally flown at a thousand feet above ground or above aerodrome elevation. And of course, check the CFS. Before we get to the diagram, let's review those procedures uh, at that airport. And as stated here, the pilot must weigh the options, deciding and broadcasting his intentions or her intentions. All right, here's our diagram. We've probably seen this a hundred times, but let's, let's break this down into its elements. And now we're focusing on the ATF 
uncontrolled, no other management going on airport, okay? Uh, as we'll see in this, in the next slide, somewhat MF procedure, somewhat more flexible, since there is probably a flight service specialist who uh, is helping uh, mo uh, monitor and providing airport and traffic information and is providing this to arriving and departing aircraft. For the ATF arrival, right from the first day of training, departing and arriving and flying the circuit is something a pilot does more than any other exercise. And yet some pilots have somehow forgotten that these lessons, some have forgotten these lessons and act as if they are not clear uh, on the arrival and circuit joining procedures at an ATF or an MF. The TC AIM, uh, Aeronautical Information Manual, does provide detailed guidance and the diagram you see here is drawn from that. It's vital that these guidelines be followed to ensure that aircraft arriving are coming into the circuit where they are expected to be and not just showing up more for their own convenience and often from out of nowhere. So how are we gonna join the circuit at an ATF? Answer, go through the routes of arrival as depicted here in the red slide. So clearly you've got the upwind side arriving uh, from that upwind side, possibly on an angle, proceeding directly across the airfield as designated by the red line, and then joining about the midpoint on the downwind leg of typically the left-hand circuit. You may join straight into the downwind, as it says on the left-hand side of the slide, but again, that's only if there is no conflict existing. In other words, no other traffic in the circuit at the time of your arrival. So entering an airport, uh, an MF airport, is a little different. And as it says in the TC AIM, this is how the airport sh arrival should be conducted. It's still vital that these guidelines are followed to ensure that the uh, people in the circuit are, uh, you are arriving where they're expecting you to be. Okay, uh, same thing as on the last slide, the key here is that we want to broadcast our intentions and we don't want surprises, right? So you can see here, we've drawn in green, the typical ATF, which is still very acceptable at the MF airport because now of course, we're doing this in concert with uh, the flight service specialist who's helping us maintain our information about uh, where we're going, what we're doing. Okay, we also have a couple of options as you can see on the slide, the blue options there, either on the base leg or on final or entering the downwind at a 45 degree angle. But uh, these are special situations for the MF airport. And again, contact must be made before entry and the coordination of this arrival must be clearly broadcast to the FSS specialist and to all the other aircraft. So again, there are no surprises. All right, in the case that we're looking at today, uh, we're looking at something, as we said, that happened overhead carp in 2018, uh, about three years ago. And honestly, this accident shouldn't have happened. It was a beautiful VFR day uh, the, uh, with light traffic. And as we know, a CARP uh, just above the circuit sits Class C airspace managed very effectively by the aerodrome Air ACC uh, known as Ottawa Terminal. IFR arrivals and departures from, uh, arrivals and departures from and into this airport are managed by that ATC team. But the actual circuit at CARP is Class G airspace and it allows for no traffic, there is a Unicom at 122.8, but it's not all monitored, always monitored by staff. But the, uh, the circuit can be seen by the Class C radar in Ottawa. Transport Canada establishes an ATF at an aerodrome such as CARP to ensure that all radio equipped aircraft operate on the ground or within the area, or within the area are listening on a common frequency and following common reporting procedures. All right, now, as we said in the last slide, um, the 
there is the option to be Nordo, but it is pretty much an exceptional circumstance. And it's very important that people know what's going on if you're up there doing stuff by yourself. In this case, both pilots were effectively solo and current in their aircraft. Uh, they were flying uh, very familiar with the local procedures. Les deux appareils étaient en état de navigable today. Uh, they were both airworthy and there should, should be no problems, right? As we said on this bright and clear day, uh, conditions are perfect. Unfortunately, the Cessna did not appear to be using his radio. The Cheyenne aircraft uh, departed IFR. And while it had plenty of aids to, be, to advise the pilot on the other IFR, or VFR traffic, it wasn't aware of the presence of the 150 as the Piper Cheyenne returned to the CARP circuit. So the Cheyenne pilot coming back heard nothing and saw nothing on uh, any of the equipment that he had that might have made it easier for him to figure out what was going on. Uh, the Cheyenne had, pilot had departed IFR and uh, had been told by the Air, Air, Air Traffic Control Center, uh, Ottawa Terminal, that they had no traffic at the airport. The 150 doing circuits wasn't using either the radio or the transponder, both of which are legal in class D airspace, but not very helpful to others who might be passing through or into the area. In this case, as we see here, we have a uh, almost the perfect storm, the perfect setup, where we had a 150 doing circuits and a rather a much larger Cheyenne 400 XLS low wing turboprop uh, with two very large nacelles, uh, perhaps inhibiting the view of the pilot. And uh, that right hand picture is looking at about the angle that the pilot would have had to look down through as he entered the circuit from the north uh, into the downwind for runway 28, had to look either through that left engine or the right engine to see anybody in the circuit as he was entering the circuit. In the Cessna, we can see where the aircraft, uh, the two aircraft collided with the impact on the right wing wheel of the Cheyenne hitting the Cessna 150 about midpoint on the left wing. So uh, what do you think were the main contributing factors to this accident? Selon vous, quels sont les principaux facteurs qui ont contribué à cet accident? Now, I know you can't answer right now, uh, but we will be uh, taking your answers during our question and answer session at the end. All right, so um, the Cheyenne was equipped with a system called TIS-A, but uh, this was not useful in Canada as a traffic avoidance or traffic alert device. The Cheyenne was descending into the circuit from the Northwest, made all the appropriate radio calls three times and was at the proper circuit joining altitude. Uh, the collision in fact was at circuit height, about 1400 feet ASL at the mid downwind point. The Cessna itself was on a slightly abbreviated circuit and was probably in a left turn with his left wing down in the turn and created almost the perfect angle to block the Cessna pilot's view of the approaching low wing airplane. The approaching Cheyenne, of course, would have had a very difficult task of acquiring the Cessna visually uh, because that would have meant that the pilot of the Cheyenne would have had to seen through the metal surface of the airplane, which is pretty much impossible. So some kind of electric uh, alerting device or a radio call or a transponder that was on made of, would have might made all the difference in the world. Unfortunately, the uh, 150 uh, 
left wing hit the right rear right gear on the Cheyenne, uh, which caused the wing to fail and uh, depart the Cessna, which thereby ensuing a rapid descent and fatal impact with the ground for the 150. The Cheyenne uh, had a major damage to the right landing gear. Uh, the pilot was, of course, shocked, stunned, wondering what had happened because uh, he had absolutely no awareness of the aircraft being there. The Cheyenne uh, diverted, declared an emergency, and carried out an emergency landing on runway 14 at Ottawa, which was essentially a straight line flight of about 15 miles from, uh, from the uh, downwind point over CARP to the runway on runway 14. So how could the pilots have mitigated the situation to avoid this accident? Comment les pilotes auraient-ils pu atténuer cette situation pour éviter l'accident? And we'll, re we'll get your answers to that question in the second part at the end. So here's Here's a uh, Google Earth view of overhead the CARP airport. You can see the circuit in red, uh, red dashes. We can see the flight path of the Cheyenne, that's the CF CSL aircraft. Uh, we can see that he was doing this entry essentially by the book, right? Uh, perhaps uh, much to uh, chagrin of the 150, Golf uh, Mike Zulu, uh, that abbreviated circuit with a shorter upwind leg, uh, a brief crosswind leg and a shortened downwind leg might have made um, the difference and caused the collision because as you can see, the pilot of the 150 was just barely rolling out as uh, he encountered the Cheyenne. And we had a classic, uh, low wing, high wing, high wing airplane in the turn situation. And with no other aids other than visual aids, the results were unfortunately almost predictable. So quoting from the rack section of the AIM, we can see that it says here, and I'll read it aloud, VFR pilots should maintain a listening watch and be aware of local flying. They should also state their intentions before entering the maneuvering area during departure or arrival and while completing continuous circuits. Although strongly encouraged by Transport Canada and considered good airmanship, communication on aerodrome traffic and frequency is not mandatory by regulation while operating under VFR. So as we said in the last slide, you know, if the pilot of the 150 had been communicating and had told people what he was doing, the Cheyenne pilot almost for certain would have known that he was there and could have taken some kind of action to ensure that he acquired the aircraft visually before uh, entering the circuit or had a better idea where the airplane was. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. C'est la même chose en français. Et je pose la question, est-il dans le temps de changer euh, cela, la phrase de, de la M, de TC? So we talk about the idea of see and avoid, but we need to enhance our ability to see the other aircraft by any, any and all means possible. See and avoid is not a panacea, TCAS isn't either. Radio calls, believe it or not, do provide early warning to all aircraft. The use of landing lights, which the Cheyenne I'm sure had on, would have happened when the gear came down, and other devices such as strobes would enhance the visibility to all participants. The transponder, même sur le BFR code de 2000, peuvent alerter les avions équipés de systèmes de tas. High wing versus low wing creates challenges and requires additional proactive measures. Et l'arrivée à 500 pieds au-dessus du circuit pour regarder le circuit et une mesure de sécurité recommandée. All right, so there's uh, 
there's our the drawdown of that event. So we're going to take a one minute pause uh, and we're going to continue on to phase two with our next consideration, which is the loss of control in flight, in this case, at night. Be back in a minute. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Peter. And for those of you who have questions, um, hold on tight. We will have a dedicated Q&A session a little bit in the afternoon uh, where you can, you can unmute yourselves and ask as you please, uh, and Peter will be there to support. So see you in a bit. Okay, we're going to continue now with uh, phase two. So now we're looking at a different situation. Uh, we're going to consider another aspect of the VFR circuit procedure, approaching either the aerodrome traffic frequency or airport or the mandatory frequency airport. But in this specific case, we're looking at the mandatory frequency airport at night or at nightfall. And what uh, we uh, also are gonna look at is what we mean by and the challenges that come with night VFR weather as guard, regards to visibility and uh, VMC, VF visual meteorological conditions versus instrument meteorological conditions. One of the challenges, of course, uh, in VFR at night is the lack of cultural lights. Uh, that can lead to spatial disorientation due to the minimal cultural lighting at night near an aerodrome, coupled with maneuvering towards the airport, uh, requiring very good situational awareness and maybe getting into or having to use a mixture of those techniques we learned when we got our light rating of both VFR or IFR techniques, um, challenges in the base turn to final, which can also lead to disorientation uh, due to visual illusions uh, and stimuli from our bodies that are telling us uh, conflicting information about what our instruments are seeing and of course, remembering that old phrase that we learned a long time ago about always trusting your instruments. We want to study and contemplate what happens at night with uh, the loss of control in flight when we try to cheat the weather uh, and do it in near marginal or variable VFR conditions. So let's just take a step back uh, to our last PRTP where we looked at CFIT or controlled flight into terrain. And if you remember that one, we were dealing with uh, some gentlemen who were in a 182 flying in the mountains of BC and unfortunately had a very unhappy experience uh, that ended with them flying the control in control of the aircraft uh, into the terrain, uh, rocky terrain in BC. Uh, lock eye or locky is the loss of control of the aircraft in flight that results in a collision with terrain or obstacle. Okay, and uh, it's sad to say, but Lucky has contributed to more deaths than CFIT. In fact, uh, as we'll see in subsequent slides, um, it's probably the most uh, tragic or most, uh, most often occurred accident uh, over CFIT. And in this case, so the, the pilot we're gonna look at, he probably almost became a CFIT a uh, statistic earlier near the Peterborough airport in his flight from the Toronto area to intended to near Quebec, never got there. All right, so for this case study, we have a pilot who should have been just fine with changing the plan from going en route to near Quebec, but he wasn't as aware or considerate of the weather as he flew on towards Quebec. And uh, as we said on the previous slide, arriving at airports uh, with a mandatory frequency such as Kingston or, or immediate airports such as uh, Gatineau require excellent situation awareness and coordinates in which the air dome traffic services personnel and using the MF radio prior to entry, meaning you know where you are. As we said in the couple of slides ago, we require the ability to and uh, the pilot skills to maneuver and conduct a base turn or perhaps an entire circuit. And if we compound that uh, with night VFR conditions with uh, marginal or little lighting and challenging weather, the 
we're talking about a significant workload. In this case, we had a uh, USA aircraft maneuvering at night in marginal weather near Kingston. The transition for this pilot was from day VFR to night VFR, unfortunately not well handled by our US-based pilot, even though he was IFR aware and experienced and was in an IFR, very IFR capable airplane. Uh, we'll take you back in time to November 27, 2019, uh, a flight that left the Buttonville Airport at about 15.30 local and uh, did not make it all the way to two hours later at 17.30 local. Uh, the aircraft uh, in this flight was a PA-32 Comanche 260, manufactured in 1965, registered as a November 50 Delta Kilo. They were on a VFR flight plan from Buttonville CYKZ to Charlie November Victor 9, which is about nine miles east of the Quebec City Airport. The flight path, which we won't see all of today, uh, showed many diversions around weather as we went from day to night. Uh, the uh, lighting in that area, uh, the lack of cultural lighting in that area, definitely a factor. The weather, definitely a factor. And another example of an, an NPA that we'll look at uh, later in this presentation. Unfortunately, uh, we had one fatal pilot and six passengers fatal. Uh, the aircraft was destroyed. There was no post-impact fire. In fact, in this case, the uh, entire family was killed. Very tragic. So the other thing that we want to look at here briefly is how quickly this whole thing went wrong. If you look at the upper left-hand corner at 1702.55, so just about 1703, was the initial radio call late, very late. Uh, he was already inside the uh, mandatory frequency airspace uh, for classy airspace at Kingston. Uh, initial call at 2,400 feet in descent. So about a thousand feet, a little bit more than a thousand feet above circuit altitude. Uh, not a minute later, he was in a gradual left turn, a thousand feet lower in descent. Uh, and talking to uh, Kingston Radio, uh, who was trying to help him out, uh, the pilot was very obviously disoriented and not sure of his direction, not sure of his location. Uh, not even a minute later, uh, he had descended rather rapidly all the way down to barely uh, 300 feet above ground at uh, 1704.38 and Roughly 50 seconds later, he had in fact impacted the train a couple miles north of the runway and that in fact was fatal. In all, from start to finish, about 180 seconds. And that's all it took to go from flying to dying. So a question we've asked you already. So what do you think are the main contributing factors to this accident? Selon vous, quels sont les principaux facteurs qui ont contribué à ces accidents? From my perspective, we have weather, marginal VFR in rain and low clouds, near freezing temperatures aloft, no Canadian weather data while this pile was in the air. The lighting was definitely a factor, a day to night transition with minimal cultural lighting between uh, west of Kingston. No lighting from the stars and moon due to cloud cover experience, limited nighttime experience, and no experience with Canadian ATC, airport data, and unfortunately, even though this pilot was flying on four flight, no Canadian four flight data when compared to flying in the US, no ADSB data for weather or anything else either. This next shot shows you what was happening weather-wise over Kingston at 1700 Zulu, or sorry, I'm kind of local, sorry. Essentially two minutes before everything went very wrong. As you can see the pilot in his flight path, which I don't have, but basically if you look down on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see Peterborough, Belleville, Kingston. That was essentially the route of flight. Uh, he was just emerging from some fairly significant rain showers, and we know also low ceilings. Uh, this image probably says more than a thousand words about what the pilot 
was experiencing as he approached Kingston, almost dark in the rain, either just in or just out of cloud. Um, and he clearly wanted to land at Kingston. It wasn't part of the original plan, had not made any prior calls to Kingston, showed up on the radio and basically wanted to get the heck on the ground. You look off to the east, which is where he was supposed to be going, towards uh, Montreal and Quebec City, even uh, significantly worse weather beyond Brockville, uh, the Cornwall area, very heavy rain, uh, and low cloud. So this USA PPL pilot with a night rating and 30 hours of experience was current in accordance with the US regs, not IFR rated, but did have about nine hours of instrument experience while flying in Texas. And uh, this uh, helps to explain some of the situations. No flying experience in Canada, minimal icing experience. Uh, interesting uh, from an aircraft performance perspective, the aircraft departed Kingston with no obvious uh, weight and balance being carried out, but approximately 200 pounds over the max gross weight of the aircraft and was still about 100 pounds over gross at the time of the occurrence. Interesting uh, transport uh, safety board it made extensive use of the ForeFlight app on his iPad, which was recovered. And uh, to see what weather data he was using for flight planning before he left and also following the digital trail of the flight itself. The, uh, we'll get to a bit more detail in a moment on this, but one of the things that the uh, ForeFlight told and the GPS sensors told uh, the TSB was in that last fatal descent and climb before he crashed and lost control, the pilot uh, exchanged altitude for airspeed at a significant rate and then pulled up at almost uh, a 2G pull up, at which point he went from uh, about 120 to 30 knots, almost, almost to stalling speed before he lost control of the aircraft. Uh, for flight data, it was he here, as it says on the slide, Interesting how much data the TSB was able to retrieve from the iPad and the app, as well as the GPS device in the aircraft. So you want to be aware that you are leaving a data trail that is potentially incriminating, uh, but more importantly, it showed that he had looked at the weather. Uh, he knew that the weather the next day on the 28th was going to be snow. This was a family visit to somebody in the Quebec City area. So he decided to press and go on the 27th. He was originally supposed to leave at about 11 o'clock in the morning. It was now three o'clock in the afternoon. It was November, night was coming. He was aware of that. The forecast weather at the ETA for Quebec City was 600 overcast, one mile and light snow with a probability 30% of a quarter mile viz in heavy snow and 400 foot obscured ceilings. That's not VFR in anybody's book. It's not even IFR. It's worse than IFR. So the self-imposed pressure this pilot put himself under was immense. We used to call it get home itis, right? Get the mission flown. It was definitely a factor here. We knew that he knew that waiting until the next day would be worse which only put himself under even more self-imposed pressure. He was entering a route that was either marginal BFR or IFR with icing conditions above at a planned altitude of 3,500 feet, which he didn't actually stay at very long. Unfortunately, there was no four flight data for him uh, en route, no ADSB data available for his uh, four flight description. He had no Canadian airport information and clearly the weather was not suitable for night VFR, no horizon to speak of, and very poor viz, and very low, if any, cultural lighting whatsoever. So we asked the same question, how could the pilot have mitigated this situation to avoid the accident? Comment le pilote aurait-il pu atténuer cette situation pour éviter l'accident? Again, we'll uh, get to this during the Q&A session at the end, but uh, clearly one of the answers to the questions I pose is the pilot should have been much better prepared uh, than he was 
And how many of us could do the same thing if we were flying in a foreign land or area that we weren't familiar with? I would submit that he wasn't familiar at all. And that lack of familiarity uh, was ended up in his demise. So some of the conclusions that we that come out of the TSB report, the pilot elected to depart Kingston, sorry, uh, Buttonville, uh, not going to Kingston, going to, to, to Quebec City in marginal weather uh, that was really not safe uh, for day or night VFR. He did avoid IFR weather near Peterborough when he descended to almost uh, barely 400 feet above ground, took no diversionary action, was very close to Peterborough, was probably unaware of it, or even Trenton, uh, which he flew almost directly over, Trenton Airport that is, prior to Kingston. No attempt to contact Trenton as far as we know, and no data uh, updates from foreflight, uh, prohibiting really him from really doing any PDM. And I would describe him as being data blind. So he went into this flight. Uh, once, he on, once he got on the airplane and fired up and took off, he was data blind really for most of the flight. Very unfortunate. Uh, the arrival at Kingston, the being data blind was compounded by operating in an unfamiliar environment, which gave the pilot even more pressure and influence. Plus he had his entire family on board, which I'm sure was even giving him more pressure. Uh, influences uh, causing bad PBM, absolutely. Uh, making matters worse, of course, disorientation, evident in the positional reporting errors, uh, not talking to anyone at either Peterborough or Trenton that we're aware of. And uh, while approaching the airport, he definitely became spatially disoriented uh, lack of references, lost control of the aircraft, and had unfortunately a what we call a lock eye or locky accident. Uh, TSB uh, commented on this and also in the CARAC NPA 202107, we get the following statement that the uh, majority of Canadian airspace, whether in controlled or uncontrolled, sparsely populated, very little illumination, no or no illumination suitable to provide pilot with visual references to the surface during night VFR flight. Such areas of darkness devoid of sufficient illumination actually meet the definitions of IMC rather than VFR. But this proposal is a result of um, these types of accidents. The proposal, of course, of course we're talking about is CARAC NPA 2021-007. From the TSB, TSB report, TSB put it on the line. So they said the following, they said, if the cars is not clearly defined what is meant by a visual reference to the surface, night flights may be conducted with inadequate visual references, which increases the risk associated with night visual rules flight, in, including controlled flight into terrain and loss of control accidents. This comment and others like it are why the NPA to 2021-07 was initiated. Much evidence points to the benefits of having a discernible horizon to fly VFR and be operating in visual meteorological conditions so that you're able to see the horizon and clouds around us. If we can't because of a lack of lighting, uh, then are we in IMC or IFR? My answer is yes, we are. Probably IMC and maybe even IFR. Right, okay, phase three. So again, we're gonna take a little pause uh, here for about a minute and just for everybody to take a breath, take a stretch and we'll be back briefly and uh, Sharon, if you're there, if you want to pop online for a sec. Absolutely. Hi everyone. That, uh, this has been fantastic and I'm sure you have a ton, a ton of questions. As always, I'm, I'm often learning from, I'm always learning from uh, these seminars itself. So hold on tight, use the chat function, start putting in those questions there and we'll, we'll keep them handy for the Q&A that's scheduled for 3.30 to 4 p.m. Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you.
Okay, let's uh, get going with part three. So unfortunately, we're not doing too well. We've lost a 150 and we've lost a, a PA uh, uh, Comanche 260 so far. So let's look at part three. Uh, we're now at the point of getting ready to land. We wanna look at part three at the stabilized approach, the transition from en route and after the descent to landing and situations that may cause us to not land, but have a rejected landing and a goal round. And that's one of our case studies. So we're looking at l'approche stabilisée, transition vers l'atterrissage. L'atterrissage et la remise de gaz étude de cas. So a couple of definitions. So from 2014 to 2017, there were 127 abnormal runway contacts and runway excursions and accidents in general aviation. So we got to ask yourself, what is a stabilized approach? Uh, are we on the correct and desired final approach flight or glide path? Have we done our pre-landing briefings and checklists? Are they complete? Are our passengers alerted? Are we ready to land? Is our aircraft properly configured? with an appropriate airspeed for the wind and runway conditions. Okay, over 30% of non-commercial GA accidents occur during the landing phase of flight. As we said just a few minutes ago, from 2014 to 2017, there were 127 abnormal runway contacts. Since 2019, the Transport Canada PPL Flight Test Guide has provided a generic description of a stable approach, and here it is. Okay, stabilized approach, VFR general description. On the correct final approach flight path, briefings and checklists complete, aircraft must be in the proper landing configuration appropriate for wind and runway conditions. The proper, appropriate power settings have been applied. Our maximum sink rate of 1,000 feet per minute is not exceeded. The speed is within plus 10 to minus five knots of the reference speed or VREF only small headings and pinch changes required uh, should be acted. And most importantly, that we're stable by 200 feet AGL. If stability is not established, an overshoot will be executed. COPA fully endorses the stable approach technique for all approaches VFR or IFR. Note that in this stabilized approach, changes to any of the factors we talked about previously should result in a decision to reject the landing and do an overshoot prior to or at the go, no go decision height. Okay. We now have a picture of that beautiful stabilized approach. Note that the glide path or flight path, if you will, from left to right is a straight line. It may be cliche to say a good landing begins with a good approach. Approach, heck, I've been teaching uh, in the general aviation world for over 11 years and I've said it hundreds of times to students and qualified pilots. So maybe I should just stop the presentation right now. No, I don't think so. Unfortunately, the accident data tells us otherwise, doesn't it? This is what it should look like. We still need to ensure a safe touchdown landing roll. How many of you have established or do establish a predetermined touchdown point with an aim point, two points on the runway? For those who do, how many of you are committed to that touchdown point at all costs? For example, even though you've chosen a touchdown point, if you pass it, do you still land? Do you push it? One more question. In a typical small GA aircraft, for a successful touchdown on a predetermined spot, where should your aim point be? For those who do not choose a touchdown point with an aim point, or for those who are not committed to a touchdown point, you are probably finding that you are either occasionally or perhaps even consistently landing close to or beyond one third of the way down the runway. While it may be working out for you, the risk of a runway overrun is high in this case. And if you are consistently landing beyond one third of the runway length, especially if you're flying in those trips of less than 3,000 feet, then you've got a few problems. 
In a few minutes, you'll see a good example of this in today's case study. All right, so just, uh, just going back to what we said a few moments ago, we want to establish some SOPs. So here are some guidelines to the success for that stabilized approach. So we've got a stable glide path. Therefore, a power setting that is set should be appropriate and applied. If we're configured, then there should be no changes to the configuration. We shouldn't be using, we shouldn't be starting at part flap and then using full flaps in case we get into trouble. That's the first sign. If you're reaching for that flap switch, something's wrong. Your normal GA aircraft sync rate on a reference speed approach should be in the area of 700 feet per minute with a maximum of 1,000 feet per minute. Your airspeed should be within plus 10 to minus five of the aircraft reference speed for the approach, the ref. Wait, what? The ref, what the heck is that? I never heard of that before. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Really? V ref is 1.3 VSO times a percentage of that comes from landing weight versus over gross weight. In other words, if your landing weight is 90% of your gross weight, then you would take 1.3 VSO times 0.9. That is your V ref speed. And I would almost guarantee you that if you actually did the calculation and flew those air speeds, you'd probably find yourself shocked at how slow you're flying. And that's the speed that you should be at. You may need some practice, but it's what you should be doing. Doing so will allow you to establish a stable approach. It will allow you to get to a go no call point in confidence and make that stable call, confirmation verbalized no lower than 200 feet above ground, that you are stable. And this is perhaps the most important part of the stabilized approach concept. Ask yourself, what are the risks of continuing an unstabilized approach? Hmm, all right. Let's see if we missed anything when we get to the next slide. Okay. If, go no, if at go no go point, if we are too high, going to land short or fast or long, if we're going to land off center line, if we're going to land hard because our sink rate is greater than 700 or even greater than 1,000, if we're going to bounce, balloon or porpoise, then we're probably also going to experience a runway excursion, either to the side or off the end. Probablement un sortie de piste. If stability is not established by 200 feet, then we should Reject the landing and go around. Rejeter la traversage et fond un demi-tour. And uh, just to help you with a little bit of a fun video here, we'll play this. There I was that one fine Sunday afternoon, just me and my airplane at a little airport we'd never been to before. We were on short final and nothing was looking right. I was seeing red over red, white over white, and I couldn't see to remember how that saying went anyway. But I was staring straight down at the runway and all I could think of was I was setting myself up to ungraciously dismantle this perfectly good little airplane. And, and then off in the distance I heard a voice. And I think it was that of my flight instructor saying, always go away. You can always go around. If you don't put right, come down. Don't wait until your side is being sliced on the ground. And always go around. I know that when I learned to fly, my instructor was yelling in my ear. Now we're in the car, be cold. I'm out pitch, lots of dough. We get around the pack one more time again. But I know now, he was showing me that just because the nose is pointing down, you can know. 
you had a little moment or two there maybe you almost uh grit your teeth and you probably noticed that the uh, piper twin engine aircraft that landed probably at the three-quarter point on the runway uh that's down in the caribbean somewhere and you notice where he ended up uh because he did not go around so we need to set up to transition to our landing safely one of the things we need to determine is your touchdown point Clearly in this picture here, what you can see is we have an aiming point, typically somewhere around the numbers or the so-called piano keys just ahead of that. And that's going to allow us to transition to a touchdown point in that first third of the runway. Touchdown point should be within about a thousand feet from the runway threshold, ideally 500 to 700 feet from the threshold. Should be no more than a third down the runway. There should be sufficient runway after that to roll out. And you must ensure that you can clear all obstacles on the approach. You must be able to reach the runway in the unlikely event of an engine failure on the approach. And you also need to keep a margin for an undershoot. So once you have a predetermined your touchdown point, how will you determine your aim point? In a small GA airplane, the aim point will always be prior to the touchdown point to allow for that extra lift and float that will occur when we transition to the flare. If the approach speed is correct, you should not float more than about 200 feet, maybe less, depending on flap speed and your airspeed. Note for every knot above the recommended approach speed, your touchdown can be up to a further 100 feet down the runway than what is stated in the POH. Remember, of course, in the POH that you use for your planning, there are recommended approach speeds right, recommended uh, height over touchdown speeds. Guess what those air speeds are very close to? They're very close to the V-ref speed that we talked about before the presentation. Air speed is so vitally important to the success, success of the approach. Too much is not good. All right, so here's what that go around looks like, right? We all of a sudden, uh, have got ourselves to a point where we made our decision. We had applied max power. We've adjusted our pitch attitude. We've allowed airspeed to increase. We've adopted a climbing attitude at our climbing airspeed. We put our flaps up to an intermediate section. Uh, we've established a positive rate of climb. We retracted the gear if it was down and we retracted the remaining flaps and now we are climbing away, okay? It's important that we use the correct procedure on the go around to avoid a loss of control situation, right? Two main concerns we have when we apply power and transition to climb are yaw and pitch. What yaw is present? And that of course is propeller strips, slip stream and asymmetric thrust. Yaw directions to the left and the aircraft controls achieved with an application of right water. When it comes to pitch, why does the nose tend to pitch up more abruptly than normal? When applying a power for the go around, because the airplane has been trimmed for landing, with the flaps set, the trim is set to a nose high altitude. Apply that power, we have to push, ready to be pushed on the yoker stick and push on the rudder to effect a safe transition without causing a loss of control in the air. Alrighty, on to our approach to uh, case study. So 
we have a rejected landing case study from 1917, sorry, 2017, oh my God, that'd be a long time ago. Uh, January 19th, 2017, uh, Cessna 172S from the Victoria Flying Club. We had uh, some great talent, class two assistant flight, uh, chief flight instructor uh, with a PPL student in the CPL phase, doing practice short field approaches to a 1400 foot runway at Duncan, Duncan BC with a slight tailwind. Good news, both instructors and students had been to this airport previously. Should be no problem. Here's what the CFS says about the airport, okay? The runway is 1,495, we'll call it 1,500 feet by 30 feet wide. The winds in this case, there is no metar for Duncan. Uh, winds were light and variable, less than five knots. There are trees on both ends of the runway. There are ravines on both ends of the runway. The power line, uh, 500 feet off the runway, can be seen in the picture. Uh, there's a gravel pit adjacent to the runway. And the PIC chose to land on runway 31, which set up a slight tailwind. Note as well that the Vancouver Flying Club does not allow, sorry, the Victoria Flying Club does not allow their students or renters to go into this airfield unless they are dual only. So no solo flights into this airport. Clearly this field was assessed by the flying club as a moderately risky scenario, but was it treated and briefed as such? And does, in this case, did familiarity breed contempt? Here's an overhead from Google Earth of what the airport looks like from overhead. Ravines at both ends, gravel pit uh, on our left-hand side, four foot wind row on the west side of the runway, downdrafts, crosswinds, and wind shear may be encountered. Trees on runway 31. Strongly recommend that only pilots from the airport and local train should use this our airport during hours of darkness. Oh my goodness, yes. So note that the caution section gives you plenty of reasons to think that this is not your friendliest airport due to a number of factors that could stress out any under training pilot. So in this case, on the, airport, on the approach, the airport was not flown on a stable approach. The landing was rejected, but after touchdown and near the midpoint on a 1500 foot runway. Unfortunately, the aircraft struck the trees uh, and a power line uh, during the attempt to go around at Duncan, BC. Injuries, one serious, one minor. The aircraft was substantially damaged, ended upside down in the trees, but no fire uh, happened, thank God, and the ELT was activated. All right, so here we have the uh, Google Earth and uh, data pulled out of the TSB uh, from the radar track of the 172's flight path into the uh, airport known as CAM-3. Uh, seen from the northeast. So you can see from the bottom right hand corner, the aircraft arrives overhead, does two pretty good looking uh, precautionary approach circuits. And while the PIC and student did fly a classic precautionary field assessment circuit patterns, was there enough pre-consideration given during the pre-flight process before the flight uh, was attempted? Were performance figures and lenses calculated beforehand? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Was there enough room given to establish a slow, steep approach path? Probably not, looking at that smaller uh, rectangle that you can see there that ends up with the contact with the ground. Was there a clear, stable approach briefing carried out? Not that we are aware of. And therefore, were they, in fact, planning to fail or failing to plan. Let's go back to flight school for a moment and review what is taught and what we are supposed to be doing whenever we are considering an approach and landing into a shorter than normal airfield. So short field approach, a steeper than normal angle at slower speed is typical of the short field technique. Short field approaches demand precision flying on plan VRF speed to keep the rate of descent manageable and making the aim point. 
full flaps and side slit may be required to keep on going down, but also to meet and uh, keep the stable approach. La prochaine shot cool on angle de plus prononcé que la normale à une vitesse plus lente est typique de la technique de champ cool. Les approches au terrain cool exigent un vol de précision sur la vitesse de VRF prévue pour garder un taux de descente gérable et atteindre, dans, et atteindre le point visé. Les pleins vols et la glissade peuvent être nécessaires pour rester sur la trajectoire de descente, mais il faut aussi une approche stable. Okay, well, that, you know what? We just duplicated that slide. So on the short field approach, a steeper than normal angle at slower speed is typical of that technique. We also want to remember that the instructor should take control as required for safety management. There's no need for the instructor to impress the student and having the instructor's skills shown to make it. Le structeur doit prendre le contrôle nécessaire à la gestion de la sécurité. Pas besoin d'impressionner l'étudiant avec les compétences de l'instructeur pour réussir. OK, rejected Duncan Shortfield approach synopsis. Instructor and student were familiar with the aerodrome. Short field landing was planned, but aircraft POH performance was not calculated. The CFS cautions, they're there. Were they paying attention to? I suspect not. All right, let's continue the synopsis. The runaway had a ravine and no available overrun. The actual touchdown point at approximately midpoint was well beyond the intended touchdown point. They had less than 700 feet to go. Stable approach briefing, not SOP at that time. So what do you think the main contributing factors were for this accident? Selon vous, quels sont les principaux facteurs qui ont contribué à cet accident? Again, many factors, and uh, we'll look forward to your responses in the Q&A period at the end. Here's a few thoughts. These wording answers most of the factors. So higher airspeed and ground speed than a glide path that was planned. An unstable approach was never declared by either the instructor or the student. No decision to reject the landing and no go around was declared. The pilots probably had very little awareness of the required runway, uh, especially with a tailwind which was an impromptu decision made during the flight. Unfortunately, we see here very poor decision-making by both the instructor and the student pilot. Mauvaise prise de décision de la part de l'instructeur et de l'élève pilote. The pilots, and uh, although this is directed mainly at the PIC, the instructor, made two bad decisions. They continued, he continued to, to attempt a, and salvage a bad approach and rejected a bad landing when it was far too late. Uh, my memory is drawn when I saw this one, two, uh, back August 2nd, 2005 at Toronto International Airport, where an Air France uh, A340-300 uh, landed in some very bad weather uh, in a storm, uh, in, uh, landed at nearly the 50% point on runway 25 left, 
and ran off the end of the runway into a ditch at about 80 knots. Luckily, nobody was killed. Luckily, they all got out. Just an amazing, uh, well done to the airport uh, teams who uh, saved everybody's lives. A very bad decision process by the pilots of the aircraft. So what were some indications that the pilot should have recognized to avoid this accident? Well, we may have already recorded, we may have already come up with these, but uh, we still want to pose those questions of ourselves because clearly these two pilots continue beyond the point of overshooting. The shore field approach and landing requires careful preparations, including runway calculations and a calculation of VF, VREF, those weren't done. Considerations for only length and requirements, conditions and environment, and overshoot areas must also be made prior to the flight. Stable approach parameters need to be confirmed prior to commencing the approach. An unstable approach needs to be corrected or rejected and prior to the go around point at minimums that are going to allow the aircraft to be converted into a go around. Waiting too long is not the solution. Hoping it's going to get better is not the solution because you don't want to end up like this. This is the picture of the aircraft with the rescue personnel from the Duncan Fire Department who helped extric extricate the two pilots from the aircraft. All of this was extremely preventable, but poor decision-making and passive aircraft management and control caused this aircraft to crash. The terrorist sur should tranquil refuse qui a maltrôné les deux pilotes étaient blessés et l'avion est endommagé. Right, so what lessons did we learn today in our approach and our terrassage studies? Uh, a lot about pre-flight planning, regardless of whether it's VFR, IFR, day, night, tons amount of pre-flight planning. Uh, In-flight decision-making, it should be going on continuously. Uh, it doesn't stop, it just keep, keeps going and going and going. Specialized awareness training and specialized awareness during things like night flying. Other lessons? I'm sure there are many. Let's continue as we wrap up. All right, some things we want to keep looking at. Uh, the Aviation Safety Letter comes out quarterly uh, by Transport Canada, sometimes more often than that. It's a great, great, great source of information covering a vast array of topics about uh, VFR pilots and, uh, and GA pilots and student pilots and training situations. Please read it and use it, it's invaluable. Uh, there's also some great handouts that COPA and TC use and recommend. Uh, as we said, uh, as Captain AJ Lavlo said, Aviation itself is not inherently dangerous, but to an even greater degree than the sea, it is terribly unforgiving of any carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. Uh, we've got TCM and TC safety posters, use them. They're there for us all to make ourselves smarter about how we fly, okay? Il y a beaucoup de matériel d'information de la COPA et de Transport Canada. We want you to use them and please do. Let's help us improve general aviation safety. Il y a nous à l'amélioration la sécurité de l'aviation générale. COPA and TC want to engage with all sectors of the GA community, including all manned and unmanned aviators and operators. We want to give special thanks to Simon Garrett and his team in general aviation uh, TCCA. He is the General Aviation Flight Standards Inspector and General Aviation Safety Program Lead. My name is Peter Campbell. I'm the Corporate Director of External Relations. Uh, there is my email address and my COPA phone number. Please use them. Let us know how we did. Que pensez-vous de notre présentation aujourd'hui? Veuillez-nous faire part de votre commentaire sur le sondage qui vous sera envoyé par courrier. And let's remember that we see ourselves, right, as masters of the sky. And uh, let's not disappoint ourselves or people around us. 
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, merci beaucoup à vous tous. Et c'est la fin de notre présentation. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, that was great. And we've heard feedback from you before, uh, uh, our, our attendees of uh, the length of our PRTPs or our seminars. I think that just hit the sweet spot there of a good amount of information to absorb uh, and to now follow through with the Q&A uh, between 3.30 and 4. I'm going to just uh, share my screen here before we move on as um, our, one of the sponsors for our safety, pr uh, safety program, SiriusXM, has a commercial. You may have seen it before and, and hopefully uh, their products, their weather products uh, are, are something of use to you. But if not, you can learn a little bit more about it in the meantime. Okay, I'll share. Right now, confirming you can see my screen, Peter. Yep. Good. Hi, I'm Michael Wilton of Flight Simple Aircraft Sales. We're a full service brokerage specializing in piston all the way up to order flow light jets in North America. We have offices in Canada and the US. I started flying when I was a little kid with my grandfathers and my dad. I spent most of my childhood growing up in a Cessna 310 out of Saskatchewan. We used to travel extensively between Saskatchewan and Manitoba to visit family. That's where I caught the flying bug. Currently, I have about 1,500 hours, most of them in this Mooney and a Cessna 340. I've flown about 26 different types of airplanes and had the opportunity to travel extensively across Canada, through the US, and overseas to Scotland on a trip with my brother and my grandfather. I currently hold ratings in multi-engine and single-engine land airplanes, as well as a seaplane rating. The most important rating is my instrument rating as we use the airplane extensively for business, traveling across all of North America. I was lucky enough to get my seaplane rating last year, which has helped me in the demo of our Bori amphibian aircraft, which is an advanced ultralight here in Canada that we fly extensively VFR. I, using Sirius XM in the cockpit for IFR is really important and gives you a lot of information in the airplane. However, Using it for VFR is even more important. Looking out the window can only tell you so much, and it can't tell you what it looks like on the back side of the clouds you may be coming up to. Does it make sense to land now and wait it out? Does it make sense to find a hole? Does it make sense that the airports behind that cloud bank have VFR weather that you can get into? That's all things that Sirius XM in the cockpit can really help with and really make you a safer pilot. I currently fly most extensively utilizing my 796 here in the Mooney cockpit. Though my flying is primarily IFR, I do use it for VFR as well, as the Mooney is very efficient in both. The opportunity to have Sirius XM on board allows me to check weather en route, check METARs and TAFs at airports, and verify that the route that I've chosen is the right one for the weather that day. It also allows me to take the puck out and use it on my Aero 510, which I use extensively when I'm flying the Bore Amphibian Advanced Ultralight. That aircraft is exclusively VFR, but having Sirius XM on board means that I'm a safer pilot. Having the music capability is great, especially when you have passengers in the airplane on those long trips. I've flown all over Canada and the US utilizing Sirius XM. Having it on board the aircraft with me is a critical part of my flight bag. My favorite feature is the ability to look up METARs and TAFs at airports I may be passing or maybe headed to. That gives me a great general picture of the weather that's going to be around that airport. I've used Sirius XM in the cockpit pretty much since I started flying. Even if you're a relatively low time pilot, having the onboard weather and the onboard music can really help. It's a great tool to have in your flight bag and in the aircraft as you fly. I was flying a 182 on a long cross-country flight for delivery to a new customer. They had purchased the aircraft in Alberta and I was flying it to deliver. What I found along my route was extensive thunderstorms, build-up activity, rain, all kinds of things. I was able to look at the Sirius XM weather en route and determine the safest route of flight. When it appeared that the clouds were closing in and we were going to have to land, I was able to look up the METARs and TAFs for local airports in the area to find out which one would be the safest for us to land at, which had the right services, and would be the best place for us to put down and let the weather pass. Whether I'm flying IFR or VFR, having Sirius XM weather in the cockpit is a critical part of my flight bag. If I'm flying for customer delivery 
or if I'm flying my young family, having the ability to look at the weather en route, check the METARs and TAFs at airports, and have the music to entertain the folks in the back is a huge benefit to me and my flying. I would highly recommend Sirius XM to every pilot. Okay, excellent stuff. Lots of good information there. Um, and I'm sure many of you are asking, uh, if you didn't hear Peter at the very beginning, this does qualify towards your pilot recurrent training. Uh, and so Peter, would you just remind everybody in the room how they would record that in their logbook? Yeah, sure. So uh, they need today's date, 27th of June, uh, presenter's name, mine, uh, Peter Campbell. The uh, topic, which was approach and landings, a uh, safe, uh, happy ending. Uh, and um, also the CARS references that were uh, first part of the presentation. I think it was 4018 or something like that. But uh, the main things are those first three items, the date, the title, uh, and uh, my name, and then of course uh, your signature, the pilot signature of the logbook underneath that. Very good stuff. Uh, for those who are curious about upcoming seminars, visit our website um, under Flying in Canada. The safety program is listed there. In July, we have uh, it helicopter operations, Peter, with, uh, with Garmin. Uh, July is going to be uh, mountain flying. Mountain flying and and uh, then we've got uh, August is going to be, uh, is also going to be uh, the how to buy an airplane. Uh, no, sorry, total cost of ownership. Very good, very good. And that's with um, with Phil Lightstone. Like we'll right. be hearing from uh, later today as well. Okay, so we'll just wrap up and, and uh, we'll transition over to the Q&A. So thanks very much for that presentation, Peter, and we'll see everybody again soon. Right on.